Hello and welcome to another episode of Chai, Children of Adam and Eve on QF Radio 91.7 FM, a special dialogue program brought to you by Adil Khan of Doha International Center for Interfaith Dialogue during the month of Ramadan, where we will discuss research relevant to our lives today. Dr. Narmeen Mufta has done path-breaking work in the study of contemporary Islam, both methodologically as well as theoretically, um, that will become clear to you in our conversation. Her research is based on an Egyptian movement that emerged after the January 25th revolution to eradicate illiteracy. Her ethnography traces a Muslim reformist NGO called Life Makers and their collaboration with Vodafone Egypt to make literacy a top priority for rebuilding Egypt. Thank you for being on the show with us, Narmeen, today. Thank you for having me. If you can talk a bit about the research that you have done, about the Life Makers NGO, if you could give us a a brief introduction about them and about your relationship to them through these many years. I was really interested in reading practices. So as a graduate student, um, I was interested in how it was people were reading the Quran. And so I had proposed to do research in Damascus, Syria, actually, and to start fieldwork in spring 2011 there. And uh, just a few weeks before I was supposed to go, it was clear that that was not going to happen because of what was going on on the ground there. So I relocated the project to Cairo, where I had previously some experience doing international development work there. And very early on in my time in Cairo, I discovered this national literacy campaign, Knowledge is Power, which, um, as you mentioned, is a collaboration between Amr Khalid's uh, NGO. And I say Amr Khalid's because he established it. He's actually no longer a part of the board there um, as of fall 2014. And his collaboration with Vodafone Egypt's corporate social responsibility team. And so I was really excited to discover this literacy campaign because it allowed me to sort of pursue these interests in reading practices, um, but in a different sort of way. And also, um, as part of a literacy campaign, allowed me to not just pursue this interest in reading, um, but also debates about international development, uh, particularly literacy as a form of development. Could you tell us something particular about uh, reading practices? Because that is a term, of course, which is self-evident, but there must be, there must be a lot of uh, debate about what re- reading practices are, how they are different from different contexts. Yeah. And could you give, give us a b- brief introduction about uh, how your research relates to reading practices? Yeah, thanks. So that's a great question. Um, because as you, as you say, um, it kind of sounds self-evident, right? Like what, what is so interesting about reading? Um, and is there more than one sort of way to read? So one of the things um, that I was really interested in was how the Quran got read. And by read, um, when I use the word to to read in English, I'm referring to the Arabic term um, qira'a, which is this multivalent term, which can mean both to read in the way that you and I might think of reading, um, sort of independently deciphering a text, whether aloud or silently, like in our own heads. Um, But also, the Arabic term means also to proclaim. So there's this idea that um, reading, I should say, um, is something that happens out loud, right, in communities. And so the implications of these different meanings of reading Um, can really be significant on how people come to encounter the Quran, how it is that people come to discuss the Quran, um, etc. So really, my my interests coming into the project had to do with scripture, right? And experiences, different sorts of experiences um, of reading the Quran. That ended up um, being a significant part, but not the focus of the project as I did it. Is there a notion also of uh, the way there is in the Christian scriptures that being read by the scripture, which is the same word used uh, as reading, but t- inverted onto uh, the reading subject, that the, 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 the scripture reads the personality of 
the reading subject. So you're sort of referring here to a kind of interaction um, between the reader um, and, and the, the reciter. And the text. And the text. Um, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that um, that was not sort of what I was exploring was a sort of historical project of um, how did uh, the Quran's first emergence sort of interact with with the audience that it was revealed to. Um, I was really more interested in how um, people were engaging it, sort of whether orally, and what, what are really the impacts of this shift from the oral experience and ritualistic experiences of the Quran to now ways of reading the Quran independently. What, what happens to meaning, right, when you no longer are experiencing the Quran collectively, but are doing it, say, for example, um, on the subway, right? Which is, you know, a common way when I was doing my fieldwork in Egypt to see people encountering the Quran, right? So it doesn't mean the displacement of oral practices, but um, it does mean that there are these new engagements that significantly shape um, the Quran in Muslims' lives. Mm. Yeah. So could you call it something like a do-it-yourself kind of Quran experience that you're, it's accessible, it's at your fingertips, Hence, the meaning is also accessible. The, the, the vagueness of tafsir, which is uh, a tradition itself, is then sidelined somewhat by this in, individual reader who makes it sense, sense of it in, his, in her, her own context contextual life. Yeah, so you're getting at ex exactly the sorts of issues that I was interested in, right? So, And you're also getting at one of the ways that the campaigners um, spoke about this is what reading is going to open up for you, right? So um, one of the things that life makers would often say um, is, you know, if you join um, one of our classes, you're going to learn how to read and that's going to open up being able to read the Quran for you. And I should also say at the same time, it was also one of the greatest motivations that people would use to describe why it was that they wanted to learn to read. So I'd hear it from both ends, the sort of the popular uh, literacy discourse coming we could say, you know, quote unquote, from above, um, what sort of literacy activists were telling people um, would be a positive outcome of learning how to read, but then also, you know, those who were actually engaging um, with literacy itself. And one of the things that I found so interesting is that despite the prevalence of the Quran being a major motivation for literacy, it would really fall out of the picture in literacy. And that's because of the durability of these oral practices, or at least that's what I argue, um, is that people weren't necessarily so interested in that personal, reflective, and, you know, again, scare quotes around these terms, um, sort of relationship with the Quran that Amr Khalid, that is so important to Amr Khalid's reformist project, um, but is not necessarily always taken up by those who want to learn. And what do they do then if they're not interested in that? Uh, um, so I, there isn't one sort of simple answer for that. Um, so the literacy ex campaign, the way I went about um, doing research on a campaign was that I was sort of moving between life makers and uh, their offices. I was really interested in the volunteer ethic, why these youths um, said that they wanted to turn to literacy of all things as a way to, as they put it, continue the revolution. And then I went to different sites that they were actually implementing literacy in. So that meant going, I did my fieldwork in Cairo, so that meant going to informal neighborhoods in Cairo where literacy was typically taught to women. Um, and then secondary recipients of literacy development in Egypt include workers, uh, which is a really sort of fascinating place to do research because if you look at literacy projects in the global south, really the emphasis is put on developing women. Um, and so this gave this really sort of exciting, fresh way of thinking about literacy development um, and gender, but away from women, doing it among men and workers. And why do these literacy campaigns within factories? So one of the things that I observe in the research is that what literacy means to these different people. So again, for me, women in, in a slum of old Cairo and men in a factory just, just south of the city, it meant incredibly different things. So one basic difference would be that for women, they were taught that their literacy was important to their motherhood. So to be a good mother, to be a responsible, caring mother, you know how to help your children with their homework, which was very different from men, for example. Men spent a lot less time on reading and much more time on writing. And their literacy was considered valuable in the ways that their writing would enable them 
to represent themselves. So is this a narrative which is somewhat different to, say, the uh, results of anthropological research is coming out of mosque movements in, for example, Pakistan and the Al Huda movement. I don't know if you've uh, come across um, their work, where there's a suggestion that literacy is uh, and translation literacy of the Quran uh, is uh, aimed at uh, a new, an emerging consciousness of uh, God in people's lives. So a, a connection, a personal connection to God in their lives, in, as opposed to mediums like. Sufi figures or ulama or other mediums who might have been more prevalent over people's imagination? I would say broadly speaking, the sort of the sorts of ways that literacy was taught through this campaign is a part of an Islamic reformist project. So I describe what happens in knowledge is power um, as implemented through life makers um, as Islamic literacy development because it sort of straddles on the one hand um, Khalid's particular form of Islamic reformism, which yes, as you're describing, does try to cultivate personal relationships um, to God. And, and as I said, sort of through the Quran, through personal encounters, rational encounters um, with the Quran. But at the same time, um, on the other hand, or we could say maybe together at the same time is also a project for the nation, right? So um, it's it's cultivating not only these particular reformist Muslim uh, subjectivities, um, but it's it's really connecting these Muslim subjectivities with the state so that it's part of your religio-civic responsibility to be able to read. A bit more about uh, towards life makers, volunteers mm -hmm. themselves. And how do they perceive volunteerism? Is it similar to how Europeans and Americans have un understood volunteerism in terms of being or not being motivated by faith or by humanist values? I found it really interesting, their sort of ethic of volunteerism, because it was always front and center. There was always talk about why it was that people were doing what it was that they were doing, why volunteers were engaging with the campaign. And yeah, I mean, it was just something that they were so aware of. I mean, that has to do with the importance of intention to many of the volunteers. It was so important um, to state your intention before you would perform your good works, your hair, that intention was actually more significant um, than the actual outcomes that you would produce through your action. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say about um, the sort of the ethic of action, the voluntarism of life makers. One way that I describe it is, um, and again, in line with this idea of life makers as a reformist organization, um, is that they think of it as an updated way of traditional Islamic alms. So they're very critical, for example, of what they call um, taqlidi ways, right? So traditional ways of distributing alms, even though the organization actually does both. It does it does these very sort of food distribution, clothes distribution. So again, quote unquote, um, traditional ways of performing um, alms. But at the same time, they're very much in conversation with um, in mode discourses of international development. So, um, you know, to put it in popular idiom, they're very much into don't just give a man a fish, right? But teach a man to fish, right? So teach skills and this is one of the reasons literacy um, was so important to them because they saw it as this ultimately enabling um, these ultimately enabling skills that they could give to people that were more important than than say material goods right they're called khair. yeah so, so they're involved in hair organizations so and they are one major hair organization in Egypt of which there are literally tens of thousands is there a connection at all between hair and in terms of the traditional sense of giving alms or is that a is that a absolutely yeah, okay. absolutely yeah and so so they'll say you know some of the people I interviewed said when I would ask them you know why literacy why turn to literacy and why at this moment and some people were very particular about why they chose literacy others said you know it's it's clear it's good works and I, I want to be involved in good works so I don't want to make it seem like everybody sort of had the same thought all the volunteers had the same ideas um, that motivated them within the campaign, but they were certainly in conversation with a long tradition of good works organizations. Would you say that they had both of these aspects of what is considered volunteerism in terms of the service model and the volunteerism in terms of a sacrifice model? Like, would they have all of these aspects uh, 
in their motivations? Would there be Islamic justifications for these? Because there are Christian justifications for such uh, volunteerism. So to give you an example of the way they would talk about it, um, if you were to go to the Life Makers website, I think you would still see it today, they'll have um, sort of an icon that says, give your zakat, right? So give your alms or obligatory alms, um, volunteer today. Right. So in, in such a phrase that kind of encapsulates what I'm trying to describe to you here is how um, they conceive of their volunteerism as sort of taking up and modernizing traditional ideas um, of giving. So, so the crux there is give your time. Give, exactly. And that's give just where I was time. going. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, and so they talk about that um, very clearly. What is it that we give? So the volunteers, I should have, I should have also mentioned, who's the typical life makers volunteer? Some of them are um, university students. Many of them are recently graduated. Most of them are unemployed, and um, you know, a lot of people are writing about this in Egypt when they're talking about Egyptian youth and particularly their involvement in the revolution. Is this important demographic in Egypt? Um, of unemployed people, and so you see volunteerism is one way that many of these people. Um, make friends, occupy their time, right? The way they sort of get involved in involving themselves in these community projects. And so what they'll say to you is, yeah, you know, I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a job, but what I do have is time. And so I give of my time and my energy. And this again was a major theme um, in many of my conversations with volunteers. I'm giving what I have and that's my time and energy. And on time, it's time to remind our listeners that you are listening to Chai, Children of Adam and Eve, on QF Radio 91.7 FM, a special dialogue program brought to you by Adil Khan, where we are discussing today Islamic development with Dr. Narmeen Mufta. Do you engage with how their notions of time perhaps relate to uh, experiences of time in other contexts as well, in a comparative context of how time itself is experienced and given and conceptualized uh, perhaps differently or similarly to other contexts? I didn't have a sort of, I did, my conversations didn't include kind of abstract ideas of time. Um, but I do think that maybe one sort of response to this question would be to think about how they had spent their time um, and the sort of investments that they had made with their lives, how they saw themselves translating that through their volunteerism. So here I'm getting at these being highly educated university graduates, people who really invested um, in education um, with the belief that this investment in education would lead to productive work. Um, and how really, despite the fact that um, the sort of Nosserous dream of you go, you get your education and then the government gives you a job, the fact that that didn't materialize for any of them. I mean, the ones I spoke to, at least I'm sure there are some who are volunteers, didn't make them lose faith in the power of what education could bring you. So um, again, even though their education in some ways had sort of disappointed them or, you know, didn't, didn't materialize for them into productive work, um, they still sort of perpetuated um, this idea that education will improve your life. Volunteers assume that they are giving something of value mm -hmm. to those who do not have that commodity or mm -hmm. skill. Mm -hmm. So is that worth questioning as well? Uh, the very notion that some people think that literacy is something that needs to be spread. Yeah, so it's an interesting question. It's something I found myself um, asking myself a lot as, as I've been writing about this. Because one of the things I don't so explicitly do, at least in the writing, is based on my field work, it does seem that this campaign fails in many ways. So then for me, one of the questions is, you know, is the very endeavor problematic? And I think for, for life makers, their project of trying to, if you could say, distribute education, right, or bring education to those who haven't had opportunities or access previously, it's not specifically an Islamic reformist project. As I said, it's also very much a nationalist project, right? So they're not really unique in this way of thinking that education can solve our problems. This is this is common. This is common, you know, beyond revolutionary context, beyond Egypt. And so for me, the problems that emerge are not because of the effort, because of their effort to educate people, but the problems that emerge have to do with 
durable class structures. So for example, one of the, the things that was so hopeful about the Egyptian revolution was this idea of a people, right? A shab and the people united. Um, and then literacy development really fractures that because you end up with these educated teachers um, teaching the uneducated um, Egyptians who in a lot of Egyptian discourses are really blamed for the problems that Egypt um, is facing. So I would say that it's not, I'm not questioning necessarily um, the possible good that can be produced in, in giving people access to education. Um, but I think the questions that need to be asked are, how do we think of these differences between people? And, you know, does somebody's education make them fundamentally a different sort of person than somebody who doesn't have education, right? And and here there's all sorts of problems um, even that are created within the Islamic tradition, you know, is, is the person who knows um, not better than the person who knows. I mean, I'm, I'm misquoting, right? But um, these hierarchies about knowledge and those who have knowledge versus those who don't. Would you consider the NGO as, since it's uh, not going against the grain of a, con a contemporary belief of education is good and education is valuable, mm -hmm. uh, would you say that they're almost completing the Nasserist project of uh, an educated uh, people, an educated Egyptian person? Would you say that they're taking on the role of the state almost as faces of the state to the people. Yeah, so I think one of the things that was interesting to me about, so I did, as I said, I focused on this campaign, but I also did field work in different places. So I looked at some government programs, I looked at some other NGOs, some other different sorts of uh, church-based literacy programs, et cetera. So um, one of the things that was really interesting to me was how literacy kind of becomes a Band-Aid solution to the much larger education challenges facing the country. And in that way, yeah, I would say this this campaign, Knowledge is Power, um, is another one of those efforts to be a Band-Aid solution. And of course, that has to do with reasons of organizing, right? It's much, you could say, easier to organize these sort of ad hoc literacy projects. I, again, I focused on Knowledge is Power, but there was um, a project that just came out of Tahrir Square. People who were like, you know, what do we do now? Okay, we need to educate people. And again, in a very sort of grassroots, formal, informal sort of way, went around with um, these different literacy curriculum teaching in, uh, in these different informal neighborhoods. So literacy kind of becomes, I wouldn't say a completion of the project as you put it, but yeah, just another step on the road, right? Another way of trying to address um, that a lot of Egyptians are not getting properly educated, right? So for example, in the, um, in the factory, one of the workers was really frank with me. He said, you know, I did years of education. I can't remember precisely the year he did up to, um, but high, he, he was in high school. Um, and I still don't know how to read. And that was the same case with women um, in the neighborhood where I did my research. They all had been in school for years, but still didn't know how to read. So something was not working in the education system, right? And so then literacy sort of sort of steps in um, to try to correct that. Failure uh, that you point out is, would you say, a rather um, the, the technical inability of the school system to transmit some um, reading skills or there are other sorts of failures as well? Linked I think with there that. are all sorts of other failures. I think that's a major one for sure. Um, but then, as I said, you know, you had volunteers who were university educated um, who, you know, then encountered the failure of, of not being able to find a job, um, any sort of job, let alone a job related um, to their field. So I, I think that there are plenty of other larger structural issues um, that make at least the hope of wanting to invest in literacy as a way to solve all of these problems. They really diminish that hope because you realize um, there are so many different factors that are shaping um, education and what your education can enable you to do. Urban rural divide or the class, uh, the social class uh, socioeconomic class-based mm -hmm. interactions, like mm -hmm. different uh, d different social class-based interactions that took, might have taken place in these kind of encounters. Mm -hmm. What do they reveal about uh, contemporary Egypt, about the differences between the social uh, socioeconomic classes? And... Yeah, so it's an interesting question, and it's a question that um, 
depending on your audience, um, would be surprising or not surprising. So at least from a Western um, perspective, there's often this temptation to think of, well, we have upper classes and middle classes and working classes, um, and then maybe uh, the poor. Um, and so doing my fieldwork really sort of shows how those kinds of categories really don't capture what's going on on the ground in Egypt. So one thing that was very interesting to me was that um, life makers were not the urban elite that um, some of the literature would perhaps um, have us think. So a lot of that's been written about um, Amr Khalid and his followers, people who are interested in Amr Khalid, um, says that these are elites, these are upper class, upwardly mobile life makers. So those who are motivated by Khalid to actually join in this NGO um, cannot be captured in that very narrow sort of way. Um, they were from all sorts of neighborhoods um, that you might call shabby or not a very good translation of that would be popular neighborhoods, um, but maybe not necessarily um, with as poor of in infrastructures as the sorts of neighborhoods that they were going into. Yeah, my primary interlocutors among the volunteers were were not the well-heeled um, Cairo elite. Um, and yet there was still a very firm distinction between them and their students. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do in the research is complicate just um, socioeconomic class um, with the very strong role that education plays in class formation. These differences between the musaqqaf, the cultured person, um, somebody who's muta'allam or educated, um, and those who are not. Um, and so often those people are referred to as ummi, which is a sort of, sort of semi-derogatory, but also just the term used for the illiterate person, or even as strong as the term gehil, which is the ignorant person. If you're interested in following uh, Nermeen's writing, her academia page has uh, information about her writing, academia.edu, Nermeen Muftah. Also, her forthcoming, hopefully soon, book will be <laughs> of much interest to people who are interested in uh, the anthropology of Islam and Islamic societies, as well as anthropology of NGO and NGO uh, and re NGO's relations to law and state and society. We would just want a last word from you on what you hope that a future of anthropology might hold in the university. University. Uh, how do you see a develop this developing methods and debates of, of, a, of a group of people who are considered anthropologists? How do you see that progressing in coming future? Well, I guess I'll help you keeping it brief and I'll help you in the wrap up by saying I don't know that I'm necessarily, um, you know, as, as a recent graduate and somebody just starting off um, in, in my career that I would necessarily be the the best person to say where I think anthropology is going. Maybe I will say is that I think it's already in a really exciting place. And by that, I, I just sort of go to my own background, which is that I myself was in an area studies department, a Middle East studies department, um, and really came to anthropology because I think it's it's kind of infiltrating all sorts of disciplines, right? People are using anthropological methods um, and political science, you know, religious studies. Um, and all sorts of humanities and social science disciplines um, in the universities. So, um, you know, without any crystal crystal ball anticipation of where things are going, I would just say I think it's it's a really exciting discipline to be engaged in. Thank you for your time today, Narmeen, and to our listeners, Ramadan Kareem. And if you have a parting Ramadan wish for our uh, listeners as well. Ramadan Kareem to anybody who is um, fasting um, and those who are family and friends of those who are fasting. Thank you very much, people, and stay tuned to our next program. And for now, this is goodbye from Adil. Hope that you'll come back to our next program. A special thanks to Ehab al-Sheikh for bringing this program to you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>